And thank you for joining us on The Spin Room. I'm your host, Ami Kaufman. Our three spin doctors today are former Canadian ambassador to Israel, Vivian Berkovich, political correspondent for Haaretz, Chaim Levinson, and columnist at the Haaretz English Edition, Bradley Burston. Good to see all three of you. Thanks for coming on the show today. Thank you. Our three topics of discussion today with our esteemed guests are, it's official, the U.S. pulls out of the Iran nuclear deal. We'll then discuss what the move by the Trump administration could mean for the heightened tensions between Israel and Iran and Syria. And we'll end our panel with the upcoming U.S. Embassy move to Jerusalem next Monday. Okay, our first topic is Iran. U.S. President Donald Trump announced yesterday the withdrawal of the United States from the Iran nuclear deal, saying he will reinstate economic sanctions on the Islamic Republic. U.N. Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez said he is deeply concerned by the decision and the other five superpowers behind the 2015 deal, Germany, U.K., France, China, and Russia, also expressed their disappointment. Before we discuss this with our panel, let's go to the Interdisciplinary Conference in Herzliya, where we are joined by former Israel ambassador to the United Nations and head of the Abba Ibn Institute of International Diplomacy at the IDC, Ron Prosor. Ambassador Prosor, thank you for joining us today. Where does Donald Trump's decision last night leave Israel? In a better place or worse place and why? Well, first and foremost, the president's decision, I think, leaves the Middle East in a better place because both the Saudis, the Gulfies, the Sunni states and Israel see Iran as a major threat to the whole region. And the president coming out of this deal basically says, look, you're violating the whole region, Iran, and I am really making the point. Hence, getting out of the deal and putting the onus on uh, European companies to decide. Either we work on the Iranian market or we work with the American market. And I think uh, the economic elements here with sanctions uh, will really drive the message in Tehran. Sir, do you think stronger sanctions on Iran might push it to be more aggressive uh, in Syria opposite Israel and also more committed to enrich uranium and develop nuclear weapons? Well, I think the regime in Tehran, uh, as we saw, was very clear on its intentions. And uh, I think they will also have to think twice before they continue in that track because there's a real feeling that uh, one, especially in the United States, so there's a president who is really determined to stop them from having a nuclear weapons program. Many in Israel see Trump's decision as a great achievement of uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, who fought the Iran deal for years now. What do you think Netanyahu's next move on the diplomatic front should be? Well, as you see, the prime minister is working strategically. As we speak, he's now in Moscow, which uh, also is very, very important because it, uh, it really puts uh, Israel in really defining its national security interests. We see Iran encroaching on Israel's border from Syria and through Hezbollah in Lebanon. So in the sense, uh, Israel here is on the front line trying to encounter the Iranians, trying to undermine and create a proxy war against Israel on our border. So as Netanyahu meets Putin today, what in your eyes would be a good result for Israel in that meeting? What does Netanyahu need to hear as Putin has basically allowed for Iranian entrenchment in Syria? So I think uh, a good uh, result would be for Vladimir Putin to understand that Israel would not allow Iran to really find bases here on Israel's border. And, uh, and really create a threat to Israel's national security interests from the Syrian and Lebanese border. That is clear without Israel defining red lines. Uh, Israel, the way it operates, really makes those lines clear without declaring them. So a good, a good result would be for Russia and Putin to understand that if it really seeks stability in the region, it should make clear to the Iranians that there are certain lines that they should not cross. Ambassador, thank you very much for joining us on The Spin Room. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Let's take it back to our panel here in studio. Let's start with you, Vivian. I'm very glad you are here today because you here on the show, you said 
that he was going to leave the deal. It's all recorded. We have it. You were right, but and you taunted me. I did. Well, I taught everyone. I taught everyone equally. I tried. Okay. Do you think though he made the right move? I do. Um, I think that uh, he was very clear that that was his intention. That what that's what he was going to do. He gave the other parties to the agreement lots of time to consider his red lines to overuse the but phrase. But leaving with no plan B, Vivian. Okay, you know what? That is so overdone, no plan B. I mean, what is that? Nobody had a plan B. And in fact, I would argue that, you know, Obama and uh, the other countries that were signatories to this didn't even have a plan A. They were so seduced by this, this legacy deal. For Obama, this was a legacy project. Mm -hmm. He had to get something done in the Middle East. He staked his reputation on it. And if that's plan A, mm -hmm. like there is, plan B is irrelevant. But this notion that you have to have it all thought through before you, you, know, before you walk away is okay. absurd. Munich agreement. What was the plan B? Who knows? But plan A isn't a plan. Would you agree with that, Bradley? Uh, to a degree, but I have to say that... Are you happy they pulled out? Are I happy they pulled yeah, out? Yeah, I think, think it was a mistake. Or... No, I'm, if, if I'm going to relate to it, you know, personally, oh, okay. I, I would say that um, what matters, I, but in, in a sense, nothing has happened yet. Because in a sense, what really matters is what Trump does as a follow-up, and if he does something as a follow-up, mm -hmm. and how Iran and Europe react <clears throat> Until that happens, nothing has changed, in fact. Right. I think also one of the most interesting things about the whole Iranian nuclear program is that it's become the path toward a legacy for every politician. Certainly Netanyahu feels that his relationship with Iran is, his, is going to be his legacy as a politician. Trump increasingly is moving in that direction, and Obama already saw it as the crowning right. achievement of his foreign policy. Okay, I want to show you something that was written uh, in your, your paper today, Haars, by the cor uh, diplomatic correspondent Noah Landau about uh, uh, Netanyahu's campaign, which has gone on for basically years. She wrote, uh, 25 years ago, an up-and-coming Likud uh, member of Knesset published a column that began with the words, the most dangerous threat to Israel's existence is not found today in Arab countries, but Iran. The worried MK was Netanyahu. Uh, the campaign that was at times ridiculed by cynics or sourpusses, as he'd called them, has finally led to a few minutes of sweet victory at the White House. So, Chaim, what, I mean, was Netanyahu uh, right all along? Is he now the big winner after last night? First of all, you can invite Noah Landau instead of me. You don't need me here. <laughs> but, uh, we like you here, too, Chaim. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, of course, in, in his political base, I think Netanyahu scored the major points uh, because he all the time spoke against the Iranian deal, and he had the luck that uh, Donald Trump was elected to be United States president and not Hillary Clinton because he, he gambled and de destroying all the bridges with the Democratic Party and putting mm -hmm. uh, all, all his money on the Republican Party, but he won this gamble, so he can score political points. But we all the time talking about political points, but we still need to, uh, we need to remind ourselves that the point is Iran and preventing her from uh, having a nuclear uh, a bomb, and I, I, even it's a stupid phrase. And now I want to speak to my friend, uh, Ambassador Berkovic. I think the plan B is an important thing. It's an important thing. It's an important thing. In the last three years, I I Iranian, I Iran didn't achieve or becoming to achieve a nuclear warhead. And didn't now, violate no, the agreement in the yeah, last three years. Didn't violate the agreement. Okay. And now we can, maybe, maybe, you know, they, they will cripple down by the sanctions, the thousands of people will throw out the Aitula, okay. and they will become a democratic country, but there are many, many, many options that are worse than they are. Let's let Vivian respond, yes, 30 seconds, right. we have left. You know, first, look, on the Plan B thing, that's the Obama supporters, the agreement supporters, that's their big salvo. Where is Plan B? So it's not that I don't think a Plan B is important. I'm actually big on strategy. I think that you should have a plan and something in mind. I don't think, though, that the situation in which we find ourselves today is worse than what we were in yesterday. Mm -hmm. To your point, I think a lot's happened. You know, you're saying what, nothing's really happened. We just have to wait and see, you know, how Trump moves forward. A heck of a lot happened yesterday. European officials are trying to reassure their allies that the nuclear deal uh, with Iran doesn't have to die. Do you see a scenario where Europe can somehow still keep this thing alive? And if it does manage to keep things alive, wouldn't that make relations between Europe and Israel even worse than they already are? It's very possible. I mean, uh, what, what, um, what Iran now 
uh, benefits from mm -hmm. is the idea of driving a wedge between Europe and, and the United States, mm -hmm. uh, something that, that they can play with with, uh, you know, with abandon. And uh, I think that's going to that's gonna be predicated a lot on oil prices and the effect that this is going to have on uh, the world economy as a whole and specifically on the European economy and the United States economy uh, because uh, it could have a devastating effect mm -hmm. uh, and uh, especially if United States sanctions are very tough uh, this could drop they say as much as a million barrels of production yeah. from Iran's That's the plan. He's saying capability the Price is up today. Do, yeah. Price well, is on a surge today. But do you think that the deal can stay alive somehow? Uh, yes, uh, but it's a really kind of, you know, very hesitant yes. I mm -hmm. mean, for the deal to stay alive, it's going to require Macron, basically, um, but Macron and the other, the Europeans, and to a degree, the Russians and the Chinese. But the Europeans primarily are going to have to play to Trump. Right. They're going to have to appease Trump. Mm -hmm. They're going to have to show that they can actually get Iran back to the table mm -hmm. and extract more in terms of uh, conditions. Go ahead, Chaim. I would disagree with you completely, Ambassador Berkovich, but for, forgive me, if the European will put money in order to compensate companies that will be hurted by United States sanctions in order to deal with Iran, that I know it's a very, very um, unusual step and can cause a lot of diplomatic problems, the, the deal can be alive. What, what, they don't I, have I, that money. Listen, listen to what Rouhani said yesterday. He said, if I get my benefits from the deal, I'm willing to keep the deal. But your we all, don't have that much money. They can't. Why, they not? Can't. Why not? Why the not? The sanctions are going no. to hurt Iran terribly. They, uh, they might hurt Europe as well. They will. But, but Iran, we, we need their another, economic situation. We need another factor all the time. We forget to talk about it. The China and Russia, Russia. that protects Iran mm -hmm. and in international basis. That, this, that in, and by the way, violated the sanctions before the Iranian deal. Also. When you say protect Russia, Russia, Russia can't protect them keep Iran enough. No, can they no. help them out? They can't help them out economically. No, Russia's no, no. no. Ra Russian, Russian companies can drill in Iran, they don't <coughs> trade with the United States, they're not affected by sanctions on, on uh, companies that trade okay. in the United States. Okay. The Russia, whatever uh, train companies that are building now the Mashhad, uh, Tehran uh, train line can continue to do it. Okay, and let's wrap it up. Bradley, quickly. Yeah, just very quickly, I think also, because the midterms in the United yeah. States are so close, Trump is going to have to calibrate the sanctions. Yeah. Otherwise, he'll face gasoline prices that could sink his candidates. By the way, before we go to our next topic, Chaim, can, are we going to see this uh, in poll numbers for Bibi Netanyahu, a surge just because of this uh, win? I don't think he has any from other places to get, so I think he's the maximum in his base, so I don't think... Maximum in his base, okay. I want to move on to our next topic, uh, is Syria. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is now meeting with Russian President Vladimir Putin in an effort to, quote, ensure ongoing military cooperation in Syria. His lightning trip to Moscow is being overshadowed by growing fears of an Israeli-Iranian confrontation over Syria, hours after Israel reportedly bombed a military site linked to Iranian fighters south of Damascus, and as Israeli authorities ordered bombs shelters open on the Golan Heights amid uh, fears of an Iranian reprisal. Um, uh, Bradley, how do you see the future of the... You wanted to say something quickly no, about that? No, no, no. no. Well, I wanted to say, Bradley, how, how did you see the future of this, of this Israeli cooperation going? I mean, it wouldn't be the first time that Netanyahu goes to Moscow and comes back somewhat empty-handed, shall yeah, I say. It's the ninth time, in fact. But This is but, the ninth visit. Yeah, yeah, this is the ninth eighth, time. This is the eighth eight. one. Who's splitting hairs? <laughs> okay. <laughs> In any case, Go ahead. But, but there's no question that, that Putin is now the key player in Syria. Everyone, everyone agrees. And yeah. The question is how, uh, how active he wants to be, uh, how hands-on, and, and, and also because uh, uh, he, he really is the, the, everything comes through him at this mm -hmm. point. So the question is also what, uh, what Netanyahu can offer Putin uh, in the way of cooperation yeah. that would convince Putin that it's in his interest to keep the fire as low as possible. Mm. Uh, well, I'll ask you, Vivian. I mean, uh, 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 what, what do you think? I'll, the same question I actually asked uh, Ron Prosser, the ambassador, former ambassador to the United Nations. What would be a good result of the meeting between Netanyahu and Putin for, for, for Israel, for, from Netanyahu? What does Netanyahu want? Netanyahu w wants Putin to be very clear with the Iranians that if they attack Israel in any way and if they continue to build up their military capability there, uh, they will face very tough uh, response or reprisal from Israel. So he wants Putin, ideally, to manage that. To manage 
To manage, manage the rush, to man, he wants to manage the Iranians. To manage to give the them Iran what? Exactly. Put red that red lines for well, the Iranians. To I mean that's between Putin and uh, Rouhani. Uh, okay. Okay, but he has to help them to understand that if they continue their buildup, if they continue to conduct themselves in, as they have in the past in Syria that Israel will come in and they'll face very heavy uh, I want, military I want time to weigh in on this, but also uh, mention this, this fact that the Netanyahu was, uh, <laughs> he observed this military parade uh, in Moscow, yes. and, and according to Russian uh, media, a lot of the uh, uh, um, weapons that were shown in this parade are actually being used in <laughs> Syria by a Syrian uh, army official. Uh, but yes, go ahead, weigh in. Very short. I think Putin has a problem with the West. He enjoys the uh, his, uh, relationship with Israel. He doesn't see any reason to stop this relationship. And I think, by the way, Netanyahu is a, a much more minor uh, qu um, uh, request from uh, Putin. He only wants to bomb freely in Syria without intervention of the Russians. He had to go all the way to Moscow think, to do that? Yes, I don't think he will ask Putin to stop Rouhani because it, will, really? not, it will, will, not will not happen. But I think the situation that Russia the air force doesn't mind that Israel is going into the air force, the airspace of Syria and bombing targets, and then Russia doesn't interfere. It's fantastic. It's it's a question. I mean, last time it happened, how long it can last? Last time they brought the ambassador, the Israeli ambassador, for for a conversation oh, with just, the. I, 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 I think that's a little cavalier. I think that uh, you know, to quote um, a general. Uh, this has uh, go, been going on for a few years. The mm -hmm. skies of Syria, they're, they're very, very busy. There have been more than a few close calls between Israeli and Russian uh, Air Force jets. Yes. And the Russian-Israeli relationship is a very significant one for both leaders. And I think that Prime Minister Netanyahu wants to avoid escal military escalation with the Iranians and, as a collateral possibility, the Russians. At all costs. But we hear if that anyone the, can manage the bomb it, shelters are being Putin opened can. in the Golan Heights. Do you think well, we're yeah. headed towards uh, something? I mean, I, there's, everybody seems to be waiting here for this retaliation from Iran for this alleged uh, attack by Israel on this I air base. Do you believe what you're reading the papers? I mean, today the reports. You think it's exaggerated? No, no, no. I'm not. But I'm saying no, no. I meant it in this way. Today there are reports that yeah. uh, the Israeli strikes in Syria preempted the Iranian attack. That they were right. ready to right. okay. shoot missiles over. I have no reason to doubt that. Well, okay, Bradley. Do you think this? Trump decision on the Iran nuclear deal could affect the level of Iranian uh, uh, aggression towards Israel from Syria. Be more, you know, willing to attack. Uh, well, it's retaliate quickly. Quick, yeah. quick, no, I, I, but I think that that Iran is still feeling its way in Syria. They're bringing in people. They're bringing in. Uh, I shouldn't call them mercenaries, but they're bringing in client militias, mm -hmm. Pakistanis and and, um, and the Afghanis, Iraqis, I think, as well. And and Iraqis, yeah, yeah. There are three. There are three. There are three types. Yeah. And and Iran has yet to establish itself, as we say, in yeah. in, in Syria. Until it does, anything that Iran does is going to be very very uh, sharply focused, and and they'll they'll try to avoid Israeli casualties rather than. Okay. Them. Hi, what do you make of the request from the Israeli authorities to get their bomb shelters ready in the Golan? I mean, is this to really get people prepared, or could it be a signal to Iran that Israel sees and hears everything that's going on over there? I think it's to get the Israeli people prepared. The Israelis sent a few messages in the last few weeks that yes. they know everything that you are doing in Syria and uh, the bombs and this, uh, uh, <laughs> this uh, 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 article that we had in the beginning of the week that uh, Israel knows what uh, the Iranian is going to respond, yeah. but uh, it's, a, it's, it's a very... It, I, I can tell you like this. I speak with the people next to the Prime Minister, next to the Defense Minister, and, and the, the, it's a lot of pressure. That it's, they are really, really, really afraid of retaliation that can cause a war. They think it's going to happen, right? It, 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 it could happen. It could, it could happen. happen. Yeah. Okay, let's move on uh, on that dismal note uh, to our last topic. Uh, brand new, uh, the brand new U.S. Embassy road signs went up in Jerusalem this week ahead of the upcoming May 14th opening of the mission in accordance with President Donald Trump's recognition of the city as Israel's capital. So this is finally happening. Um, by the way, why do you think the hero himself, President Trump, decided not to come? Why do you, what was, what's... Oh, I, I wouldn't read too much into that. He's got a large enough delegation. He hates traveling. <laughs> he's traveling. Right? He's yeah, got to okay. go to North Korea pretty soon. That's, that's so what I was thinking as well. Yeah. I wouldn't read too much into that. But do you expect uh, on this day, May 14th, and the day after, Nakba Day, which is the Palestinian, what they call catastrophe day for the uh, 1948 uh, establishment of the state of Israel, do you expect on those two days a lot of violence that we're going to see here, uh, uh, Bradley? Well, I, I once worked for a wire service that taught me never to, pr to predict violence mm -hmm. or never to promise violence, as I guess is the phrase. Uh, but it's very difficult to imagine that there won't be 
violence breaking out in a number of places, not only on the embassy move day and the Nakba day, but also during Ramadan, which right. immediately follows. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, there aren't many countries uh, following suit about moving their uh, embassy to Jerusalem. By the way, why isn't Canada moving their embassy to Jerusalem? <coughs> well, because uh, <laughs> Prime Minister Harper <laughs> isn't in power. Right. And, and, <laughs> forgive me, didn't you serve in the Prime Minister Harper administration? Of course I did. I didn't remember Prime Minister Harper during this time of the Prime Minister moving the embassy. You're absolutely right about that. And, too, and, but you know what? You don't want to get too far into the fishbowl. But two minority governments, it would have happened um, mm -hmm. had he... For, for sure, if he had still been in, there's no question if America led. Um, and had he had another majority, I'm pretty confident would that have it happened? would have happened. Absolutely. It's an excuse. Having said that, to answer, <laughs> nah, to, it's not an excuse. I know. I know it's a Having government. Having said huh? that, um, <laughs> why? You do it all the time. Why can't I? <laughs> Having said why that. hasn't Justin Trudeau, he came out, I, I've said this previously, I believe, on your show when this came up, that. You know, Justin Trudeau is not known for his uh, sharp repartee or his decisive uh, policy statements, particularly not with respect to foreign policy. Mm. But within 24 hours of Trump's announcement um, in December, he came out and very decisively said, we will not be moving. Mm. Hi, why? You know I could tell you why. Go ahead. Do you think it's a popular decision in Canada not to move the embassy? Um, I don't think actually that many people care, are, care yeah. right? They're not really it's not, okay. Yeah. But it does seem that Trump is keeping some of his big promises. You know, the embassy uh, pulling okay. out of the Iran nuclear deal. Let's give him some credit, Chaim, can we? He's getting points for uh, keeping his promises, but the question is if the, 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 the in the first place he needed to, to make these promises. By the way, ah. he's, he's not keeping many it's other the wrong promises. promises. Is that what you're saying? The wrong kind of promises? Uh, yeah, I, I don't, let, let's put aside this promises game and look at the decisions. I think okay. the move, moving the embassy, I think it's, uh, it's not so important. I think it, it, can, it can be used as a leverage and Israel in order to do some things towards the Palestinians. Right. He wants to, to take off this leverage, so it's his problem. The Iran deal. We need to wait and see how it will be played. That's a good segue, Bradley, because, you know, the embassy move I've seen, seen by quite a few is maybe some way to maybe uh, shake things up, do things a bit differently than other administrations were doing it. But now we have the Palestinians boycotting the U.S., uh, Mahmoud Abbas saying these anti-Semitic statements that pretty much shut the door until, I guess, people feel until he leaves the stage. Uh, this stalemate isn't going anywhere, is it? I don't think it is, but I, I tell you something else, and I have never seen polling numbers on this, but I would wager that if you polled Americans and if you polled evangelicals, mm -hmm. their support of the, of the move of the embassy would be much higher than among American Jews. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The percentage. You agree with that? Yeah. Absolutely. There are 42 million American evangelicals. No, but there not, are only not just million. in a numerical sense, but, no, but, but I, agree. Yeah, I would no, say the percentage, percentage would no be... There's no question, yeah. because the yeah. Jews all vote Democrat. The, and go ahead. No, I wanted to say that, um, you know, this, this notion you said, oh, well, there's a stalemate, right? Yes. Well, it's not exactly like there was this dynamic, uh, you <laughs> there was, know, there was peace process moving. What stalemate? What's happening now, and what I think is causing the Palestinian leadership, yeah. such as it is, to flail and panic and say outrageous things that they've always thought, um, is the fact that they're not able to rag the puck, as we say in Canada, yeah. delay, delay, create diversions in the way that they have been able to, particularly in the last okay. years under before, Obama. I think the Stormy Daniels deal yeah, well, before will, we end, go, will end up much well, better deal than the Palestinians. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. We have Chaim yeah. Levinson with a pretty amazing story today. It's kind of a scoop, I, I think. Uh, Israelis named by Stormy Daniels attorneys for transferring hush money to Michael Cohen. Is this a prank? I love the headline. Tell us a little about in the minute that we have left what exactly happened there. Well, Ma Michael Levinetti mentioned in the last The sentence, lawyer of Stormy yeah, Daniels, Michael. Some, uh, 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 some, Two Israeli, a couple, couple that transferred $980 to Michael Cohen, and I called this guy and asked him, what did you transfer $980 to Michael Cohen? He said, who is Michael Cohen? Who is Michael Cohen? And in 10 minutes, he, was, he thought it's, it's a friend of him, is, is, <laughs> is trying to fool him. And then he said, you know, my brother's name is Michael Cohen. I transferred him from my Kenya uh -huh. a, a bank account, $1,000. But how did it, it's, it's very interesting. How did it, it get is fantastic to Michael Cohen? And I, I think I have an answer, but I need to check You're it gonna, out. Oh, you have to check it still. Don't want to say and, that. And it can maybe reveal the source, okay. how Michael Avenetti got all this information. Ah, okay. This amazing information he had in the document. And as we have to go, but my assumption is that there are Mossad agents working in Kenya. Right? That's my. Okay. Okay. <laughs>
That is all the time we have. I want to thank our panelists, Chaim Livingstone, Bradley Burston, and Vivian Berkovich, who I will now also ask for some lottery numbers because you are the guru. <laughs> thank you very much, guys. Good to see you. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with a simulation game on what's next after the Iran deal with Donald Trump, Mohammed bin Salman, Federico Mogherini, and Mohammed bin Salman in studio. Sorta. Stick around.